That's you. Go ahead. Okay. This is Tracy Harris. I'm your host today on The Atheist Experience. We're broadcasting live on Sunday, March 19th, 2017. With me this week is our special guest, Phil Ferguson. Hello, everybody. From the Phil Ferguson Show uh, that features, among other things, discussions around skepticism and finance. How are you doing today, Phil? I I'm good. I'm a little bit of a shock because I've never seen the show. I've always heard the show. So Aww. it was nice to see that really cool graphic. And <laughs> that was really well done. Whoever did that, congratulations. Aww, thank you. did you. a nice job. A couple of quick announcements. Um, the Atheist Experience is sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. That's a Texas nonprofit educational foundation dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. You can catch us live every Sunday on YouTube and comment on this week's show at the current show thread supplied for every episode at our blog at freethoughtblogs.com forward slash AXB. You can also write to the show at TV at Atheist community.org or you can join the Atheist Experience official discussion group on Facebook. If you enjoy this show, you may also enjoy our other ACA podcast, The Nonprofits, which airs on the first and third Wednesday nights of each month. Links are available at the Atheist Experience website. Um, and also, just to note that after the show, uh, the cast and crew go out to dinner at Star of India Restaurant, uh, located at 2900 West Anderson Lane. We arrive a little after 6 p.m., and dinner is a social event open to atheists and atheist-friendly people. And that's in, what, like 20 minutes? Because I'm, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> no, no, we have an hour going on here, hour and a half. So uh, let me go ahead then and, and first. talk about Phil. You were gonna we were going to talk about <laughs> Phil. I have some stuff, but do you yeah. have anything you want to start out with? Well, I, I, anyone who sees me and wonders who, I can swear, right? Aw, uh, you can, yeah. Okay, whoever the heck Phil Ferguson is, you can <laughs> go listen to my Ooh. cleverly titled show, The Phil Ferguson Show. Uh, it's one-third finance, uh, two-thirds atheism, and I have a much shorter fuse to, in talking to Christians, so that's why Tracy will be the, the drop-button person, because I probably end all the calls in seconds, <laughs> so uh, hopefully it goes well. But uh, yeah, I've been involved with the atheist movement for about uh, 11, 12 years. I've been on the board of the Reason Rally, Atheist Alliance International, Secular Student Alliance, and I've been promoting and sponsoring and donating money to uh, conferences all across the United States for about 10 years. And so it ended up being my business, which is uh, retirement planning, my niche is the atheist movement. So uh, that's why I talk about finance and atheism on the show. Uh, so if you're interested in either one of those, you know, you can come check out my show. And it is interesting. Well, I you're mean, very kind. I, I'm not, no, I mean, I'm not uh, like a big financial person, but I know that whenever I talk to you about it, it's, it's always interesting. I always feel completely ignorant and then walk away thinking uh -oh. that, I, that I learned something and then probably a year later I don't remember it. But I should watch the podcast well, then. Well, it, it's kind of like we're the corollaries of each other because I talk about numbers really fast and Tracy kind of glosses over and then she was explaining to me when a gerund is a verb and not a verb earlier before the show started. Well, I'm like, gerund is never a verb, but... Yeah, see, exactly. Yeah, okay. I, I couldn't even remember it five freaking minutes, so I don't know what she was yeah. talking about and nor do I care. So, uh, the beautiful thing about talking, if I use the wrong there, nobody notices. That's right. So, Was it there, there, or there? There, yeah. There. I'm good. They all sound the same to me. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I just had a few. I, I know that people always ask the same questions to people when they're skeptics on a show. They're always like, how did you become a skeptic? But I'm not going to ask you that because everyone always asks that. And um, the only thing I'm going to say is you already told me the story yesterday. The yeah, one thing that was make up a new one. funny was that your, I guess you said your minister at one point when you were having trouble believing basically just told you just go ahead and ah, do the thing for yeah your I, I was in a confirmation class in the Methodist yeah. Church and in the South <laughs> they call them atheists but the Methodists um, in confirmation class and I told the minister that I really didn't feel comfortable standing in front of a great big audience and swearing for all of my life uh, that I was going to be a Christian and a Methodist and so we had to have a, a meeting we had spent an entire hour talking about it and that was the most awkward hour of my life and yes, his pants stayed on. Uh, but he eventually said, just do it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. A little delay out there. Uh, just do it for your parents. And I thought, do it for my parents? Isn't this true? Isn't this matter to my soul, my eternal salvation? Shouldn't that be important? And it really stuck in my head at the age of 13 
how can I as a 13-year-old ask an innocent, what I thought simple question, and someone who's 40 and wears a nice dress uh, can't answer the question. I mean, they, they finished high school, I assume. They did college. They did seminary school. Now, that's a funny name, seminary. But uh, they have all this education, and they can't answer what I thought was a really simple question. And at the same time, when I was having those questions, I was watching this show, uh, what was it called? Cosmos. And so every Sunday, I'd go to uh, church school, and then I think it was Wednesday night on PBS, I'd watch Cosmos. I'm like, one, the more I learn about it, the weirder it gets. One, the more I learn about it, the more amazing it gets. And so by the time confirmation class was over, I said, I'm, I'm done. I'm an atheist at the age of 13. And kind of ignored it for a while until I happened to live for two years in Arkansas. It's the state below Missouri. Uh, misery. I, keep, I always pronounce it wrong. And I realized what it would be like if religion ran the government. And I decided at that moment that if I was not part of the solution, I was by default part of the problem. So that started my involvement in my activism, and I've been doing that for over a decade now. Yeah. There's a long answer for you. In Texas, we have that feeling, too, of we have some yeah. thought about what it might be like if religion ran the government. And, and I just saw, uh, yeah. again, the Texas government is trying to promote a law that would allow teachers the freedom of their conscience or something like that, freedom of being able to teach creationism to the hapless, innocent little children that think that Santa Claus is real. But uh, it's all good. Oh, sorry, spoilers. <laughs> All right, so my first actual question was, why finance? Uh, wow, that's a good one. I, I wish I'd studied. Uh, when I was growing up, I knew that my dad was a stock-picking genius, and he'd always tell us about the stocks that he picked that doubled, tripled, went up five times, ten times. And when I came back from my first year of college, he sat me down and he says, all right, I'm going to show you where all the money is, so in case anything happens to me, you can take care of your mom and your other brothers. So, oh, I get the mysteries, the secrets of how he makes all this money. And I'm a very analytical and data-driven person, so I, this is before spreadsheets. But I started, well, I mean, yeah, on paper, but I'm not on a computer. I started calculating his return every year and found out that he was underperforming the stock market. So he's buying and selling all these stocks, and I have this image of him being <laughs> this super genius stock picker. Here's the market. Well, here's his results. I'm like, what is that? And so now that... You know, in skepticism, he remembers the hits and he forgets the misses. We don't want to admit that we suck at something. <laughs> I mean, it's something like 90% of drivers say they're better than average. Well, they're not. <laughs> I just drove on the roads in Texas. They're not. Um, so I was fascinated. Well, how does one money? What's the right way to do it? And it started me on this lifelong experience of trying to figure out how can I take the little bit of money that I have and turn it into more money. And... It's a weird thing that my goal wasn't necessarily to be rich, although that appears to be a fortunate consequence of it, but it was more I was driven by fear of being poor. I understand. My parents grew up, my dad was born in 1930. Yeah, yeah. So he would tell a story, and I thought as a kid he was joking. No. You know, he'd talk about walking along the train tracks and picking blackberries and blueberries and stuff and selling them door to door so they could get a nickel or a dime and buy a loaf of bread. And I thought, that's pretty funny. No, it really happened. He would go to the local church and shoot down pigeons so they could have meat. And I thought, well, that's useful. The building serves some purpose. But uh, <laughs> so, you know, he has all these stories about that. And I thought to myself, I don't want to ever do that. And I've seen other relatives and relatives on my wife's family that they work their entire lives and they make investing mistakes, horrifically bad investing mistakes. And then they end up getting twelve or fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars a year from Social Security, and they live in a single wide, literally under the power lines, and that's all they've got. And that scared the shit out of me. So I don't want to be in that situation. So, you know, the first step of how to money, and most of this stuff is so incredibly simple, it's ridiculous, but you have to spend less than you make. Right? The, the part that I help most with is part two is how to invest the money. And then the third part, unfortunately, is it takes time. Uh, I get people all the time that want to do it fast, want to make money quick. And the phrase I tell people, have you ever known anyone that's always trying to strike it rich? Did you ever notice they're always trying? If it worked, they wouldn't keep trying. They, they would be rich. But always trying to strike it rich just generally doesn't work. It's, I tell people I'm kind of the, what is it, the, the tortoise and the hare. I'm the, I'm the tortoise. 
in financial world, it's slow and steady and it wins the race in the end, but it's not particularly exciting. So, okay. You have to cut me off because I'll no, do this no, all, that, all day. that explains it. And then, what made you connect this to atheism and skepticism? Well, and, and I think when I spent that time in Arkansas and I saw what government run by religion was, I, it terrified me. And I said that I have some money, I don't necessarily have time, but I can donate to a conference. My first big donation was to Skepticon 3, and they had 500 people had signed up. It was a free, con free convention, but they had 500 people signed up. And when everybody shows up, they literally pass the hat or a plate and ask for donations to cover all the bills. But they had a big waiting list. But the room that would hold more people was going to need a whole bunch of money. So I called it, I underwrote that convention with several thousands of dollars so they could get the big room and pay for that in advance. And then when people came, they got donations. And so that conference went from 500 people to 1,200 people. So an extra 700 people got to go to an entire weekend long skepticism, atheism conference because I happened to have some money. And so that's still one of my best investments ever. And so I started doing that because I think that if we got rid of religion, and that's not going to happen, but if we shrunk its influence, we could start solving a lot of our problems that we're blinded to today because religion tells us this or that is wrong despite the evidence. And so I do, did more and more conferences and then one of them said, well, you're donating money, why don't you get a table? And I thought, hmm, what the fuck does a finance guy do with a table at an atheist convention? That's stupid shit. I, I, but I would go to so many a year that I was getting bored hearing the speakers because often okay. a speaker will give the same talk multiple times. And so I had a table and I would talk to people and you've, you know by now that I love to talk. I did find out there's something I like more than talking, hearing the sound of my own voice. But I think you're hitting your mic a little. Oh, we don't want to do that. It's okay. So I did a bunch of these conventions and someone finally came up to me and said, can I hire you? And I'm like, I didn't think I'd actually make money <laughs> doing this. I was just having some fun. Um, and so then another person and another person. And of course, uh, at some point I started doing podcasting. And now the Phil Ferguson show, I think was a month or two ago, it was the biggest month. I had like 65,000 listens in a month, which is a fraction of what this gets. But a lot of people listen to it and it's information and knowledge about how to money, how markets work, how, uh, like example, I spent 25 minutes going over the mathematics of an annuity and how it rips you off. Because people kept asking me, I listen to people like Susie Orman or Dave Ramsey or Bob Brinker, and they say don't buy annuities, but why not? Well, I know they, they don't explain it because it's complicated math. So I spent 25 minutes going over the math and I was terrified that I was lo lose my entire audience, but it was one of my most highly rated shows. Like the other thing I'll tell people is uh, don't prepay your mortgage. Uh, don't save for your kid's college. Uh, don't use socially conscious mutual funds. And it's all based on the mathematics. So I'll do a segment explaining how that works. So there's some for Okay. You. So basically what you're describing is that how uh, most people end up in a sponsorship situation for a conference because they have something that is like symbiotic to the conference. So they've got a product that sells that it yeah. would appeal to an atheist audience. But in your case, you were just simply wanting to sponsor. I was just donating. And then it sort of rolled into, why don't you table? And you're like, table what? I yeah. sell. I'm a finance well, advisor. Anyone that has a business, you, you get these phone calls yeah. where someone says, we'll sell you a list of a thousand names. They're pre-qualified. It's a, you know, by age, by income, by the size of their portfolio. And you can send out pamphlets and have them call you. Okay. What? I tell them I don't need any of that information because I cannot keep up with the number of people that call me now. So I've had to keep raising my minimum, which is not what I want to do, but I can only work so many hours in a week. And that's right. really unfortunate. So the nice thing about the show is that they can listen and learn about how investments work. Sure. It's and it, it's usually the first third is investment stuff. And then the second thirds, thirds, third, I might have on someone really cool and hip, like maybe Tracy Harris will finally come <laughs> on my freaking show. Oh, that's a horrible thing. It's horrible. We'll have fun. I, know, I need to tell that story though. I, well, I was told oh. that I had to, that I was well, that I had to host. That is horrible. Yes. I, okay, I was told that I get to host. Yeah. You <laughs> the have the show honor. with Phil, and I went on Facebook to message Phil, and I realized like, oh, we're actually not friends, and I thought we were. So I go on and I just go ahead and message Phil, and I think I sent you a friend request at the same time. Yep. And as I go to message, it comes up, and I see that there's already a message to me from Phil, and it's from. 2015 and it's him asking would I be on the podcast after I had met him at a conference and I completely didn't get it because <laughs> Facebook does the other the other yeah, messages yeah. 
And so I never saw it. And so I felt like an absolute heel. And I couldn't get on your friend list because you had 5,000 already. You I cap, don't you have capped out. It's, it's not true. It's, it caps out if you have people waiting. It's Anyway, we're not getting into Facebook logistics. Next question. Oh, there's more? Oh, I wanted to know. I, I really liked it. I mean, it's up to you if you want to tell it. But I liked your story about the car purchase. The car, oh, like why, why investing? Yeah. In, uh, uh, so the story I tell is that uh, I've been doing this for 21 years. Uh, uh, after I was doing it for about a year or two and just as a few friends that hired me, I was having my car worked on. This is the one you're talking about? Yeah. Well, okay. I guess it was the one where you were buy where it was buying a car. Oh, with the interest? Yes. Oh, that's a totally different story. Okay. So <laughs> recently I bought a new car. Uh, it's a Prius Prime 2017. Yes, I'm screaming liberal. Uh, it gets 25 miles on electricity, which is very cool. And I'm sitting in, after I talk to the salesperson, I'm sitting with the finance person. That's the really scary one in the dealership, by the way. And they said, uh, Toyota has a special. They'll borrow the money to you, lend the money to you. One, thank you. Grammar. You're the financial Grammar. guy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> lend, ah. borrow, it's these complicated terms. So it's 1.9% for five years. And I said, how about for six years? And he goes, no, Toyota doesn't do that. And I go, well, I want to borrow the money for six years. And he says, well, this other bank will do it for a slightly higher rate, let's say 2.8% instead of 1.9 for six years instead of five. I said, that sounds great. Let's, let's do that. Hitting my microphone, so sorry. Uh, let's do that. And so he prints it all out and he hands it to me and he says, well, now, you're in, now your monthly payment is going to be a little lower. Does that make you feel better? And I go, well, I don't, I don't care what the monthly payment is. And he's like, why did you want to borrow the money longer? I said, I could pay $35,000 in cash for this car right now. I'm very, very lucky. I'm very blessed that I could do that. And he's like, well, why don't you just pay cash for the car? I said, it has the truth in lending statement. I said, see here what I'm going to pay in interest over the next six years, about $3,500 at 2.8%. If instead I take that $35,000 and I invest it in the stock market, I make $3,500 on average. Now, it might go down. I'm taking some risk but it might go up. But odds are, if you do this over your entire lifetime, you will make about 10% a year in the stock market. So I'll make 3,500, 3,500, 3,500, and I'll do that for six years plus compounding. So the 35,000 might turn into 60 or 65,000, and I do all of that by borrowing 3,500 for you. And he's like, oh my God, no <laughs> one's ever explained that before. So these are kind of the things that I talk about on the show and like with the uh, don't save for college, people freak out when I say that, don't save for college. Now, there's exceptions to every one of my guidelines, but for most people, don't save for college. And there's a lot of reasons, but one of the examples I give people is if you've ever been on an airplane with a child and the uh, stewardess, hostess, flight attendant uh, says if the oxygen masks drop down, you should put on yours first because if, you've, if you have any difficulty putting one on your child, they're not going to be able to help you. You have to take care of yourself first. And it's the same thing with retirement savings. When someone calls me at the age of 55 and says, we just finished paying for our third child to go through college. We're 55 and we're ready to start saving for retirement. You're screwed. You, I mean, unless you start saving half of what you make every year, starting at 55 is not going to work. That's the third part of how to money. You need time. So that's part of the logic behind that. I thought that was a good story because that was one of the things I like about your stories is they show the sort of counterintuitive nature of how money can work. Like what somebody might think of as the thing to do may not be the thing to do. Like paying cash for the car so that you're not paying interest right. um, may not be the thing to do if you have the money. Like, like you say, it depends on if, you know, what situation you're in, but these Thing, but it, yeah, if you had the money and you could put the put it down on the car, then you could invest it. Right, and it, so like when people say prepaying their house, they'll save a lot of money on interest. That's true. If your option was to prepay in my house or spend the money on a boat, prepaying your house is a really good fucking idea. But if your option is prepaying on the house or investing that money for the next 20, 30, 40 years, you'll make wildly more in the market, even if you only make eight or 9%, but the norm is 10, you're borrowing money that's tax deductible at four. You may effectively be paying a rate of 3% to borrow it. It's real simple. 10 is bigger than three. And you can make way more money in the long run. Yeah, it, it was an interesting thing. I mean, when you asked me, he asked me last night, um, would it be better to retire with less money and no mortgage payment or with more money and a mortgage payment? And I was like, I don't know. You know, it depends on what the numbers would be. 
So it was a weird thing because in my mind, I had always thought about the idea of wanting to right. pay off the house so I don't have the mortgage payment in retirement. And he's like, but what if you could make more money and then you still have the mortgage payment, but you have a lot more but, money. And you have a very common thing because you're over 35 that you remember. Just barely. Yeah. You remember the late <laughs> 70s and early 80s when a mortgage rate might be 12, 14, 16% on your house. And when you're paying 16% to borrow money, you want to pay it off as fast as humanly possible. Yeah. But when you're borrowing money at 4%, and yeah, matter of fact, rates are, are low now. Yeah, I have every expectation rates are going to go up. I'm not really big at predicting the future, but this is pretty easy to see because the economy is growing despite politics. Uh, and uh, the people who are in charge of the Fed have told us that rates are going to go up because the economy is strong. If you have a house now and you can refinance it or you're thinking about buying a house, there's a good chance that interest rates are going to be a half to three quarters to maybe even a full point higher next year. So think about how you manage your money and what interest rate you pay. You might want to refinance. Let's see if I have anything else. I think that was... I didn't know there'd be a quiz. No, that was it. That was all I had. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about or discuss that... Uh, oh, I, I think let's have some fun and talk to some, uh, what do they call them? Theists. Callers. Yeah, callers. <laughs> Theist. The callers. And they can okay. tell us what they believe and why. All right. Well, they are telling me. Let's just, we'll, we'll go. We'll trust the screeners on this one. And we're going to start with, um, let's see, I think I'm doing this correctly. So, Ralph, are you on the air? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So, this Hi. is Ralph from Rancho Cucamonga, California, correct? Yep. Okay. Hey, and how's it going, guys? Good. You're on with Tracy and Phil. What do you got for us? Awesome. Well, what do I got for you? Sure. Well, Tracy, I got to say, you you look real good. Um, would you take my virginity? You really want to stay on the call. We need to change the topic fast. <laughs> so, well, I mean, be the best 30 seconds of your life. I, I get the self-deprecating humor, and let's move along. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Come on, what's your, what's your question? Yeah, I'm going to lean over and drop you if um, you don't have something better. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, that is my question. I mean, like... Uh, All right, well, thanks penis, for calling. Penis, 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 penis. All right, so that was a... We started with a... Okay, I no longer trust the screeners <laughs> ranking of the calls. <laughs> so we're going to look and... And I was worried about using profanity. We're going to pick one of mine now and see okay. if I can do, do better. Um, I'm going to go with... Caller one, who is Dave in Omaha, Nebraska, who was the very first caller and so has been waiting the longest, and I think he should get some precedent for that. So, Hi, Dave. Hey, Dave. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, reason I, I'm an atheist, and what I'm calling is because I uh, have been looking up in the New Testament all of the different references to slavery. <clears throat> you're, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sometimes they try to call it servant, but they were slaves. Are you thinking of being a slave? Or? <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I have the King James, so they call him servant in, in the references. Yeah. And what I discovered was something that I don't believe I've ever heard you guys talk about. Now, I'm no Bible scholar, so I'm sure this has been known for you know, a thousand years or more. But um, uh, what I found is that every, there, there's six that I found in the New Testament. And every one of them is essentially talking to slaves who are Christians. Well, sure, because they were writing the letters to the Christians. Yeah, but, but yeah. You know, when they say, you know, and essentially I, I just thought that was amazing that, uh, that, that these are slaves that are Christians. Mm -hmm. And the first one, for instance, the first Corinthians one, mm -hmm. they're essentially saying, uh, if you're a slave, hey, just stay a slave. You know, d you know don't try, you know, uh, you were called to be a slave. <laughs> and yeah, I slaves just, obey your know, masters, and they're very, very um, pacifist in the New Testament as far yeah. as everything, yeah. government, <laughs> slavery, all of that. They were very pacifistic. Yeah, but in this case, it's let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. <laughs> thou art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. 
Sure. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's freeman. And you know, it goes on. Yeah. Anyway, I uh I uh, uh I was amazed. I found six different references in the New Testament and pretty much they're all the same. You know, they uh sure. are essentially uh, uh saying uh stay you know be a slave and be a good slave. Correct. So Great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Is that, was there, um, I mean, did that surprise you? Uh, it surprised me because I'd never heard it, you know, specified in that way where, where they're not talking to a slave that might have been a Hittite or a, you know, whatever, you know, a, 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 a slave that was not Christian. But that, that, that was covered in the Old Testament. Right, right. So, uh, uh, I think that's could, when Christianity old, started, right? Say it again. I think, oh, I, I think that's when Christianity started after the Old Testament. So I, I would. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I mean, hey, I, a lot. yeah. Thank you for the point. Um, and yeah, I, I would say you're you're correct in that interpretation. Okay. All thank right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Who do we have up here? Three Christians spin the wheel. Let's see what happens. No, there's only one Christian. Oh, there's well, only there's one, one Christian. It doesn't say Christian. It just it's says theist. theist. Yeah. My, my yeah. Apologies. All right, should we, let's go yeah. then with Adam, because we prioritize the theists generally. Yeah, yeah, so the red me, one. No, I'm not. I'm going to put Adam on the air from West Virginia. Hi, Adam. Hi, Adam. Hello. How are you? Uh, good, how are you? Freaking okay. awesome. So go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, why you don't believe. Uh, I haven't seen any good evidence. Do you have some? Uh, yeah, I do. Let's hear it. You could change my life okay, right now. Okay. Can I ask a question first? You just did. Any more? <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Um, are you a naturalist as well or just an atheist? How would you define naturalist? Somebody who believes that only one world, the natural world, exists. You mean like, nothing what is a world? Like Earth or Mars? Are those different worlds? <sighs> like, like a realm. I'm talking in philosophical terms, obviously. Yeah, I'm not much of a philosophical person, but I guess... You know, I've heard the multiverse. There might be even multiple universes. So I don't know. Right, that, that, that could still be entirely naturalistic. I was talking about do you believe in anything that's supernatural? What is oh, supernatural? Yeah, I, I haven't seen anything yet. You, you have something supernatural? So you don't believe? So uh, let's well, it's not that I don't, are, it's not that I don't believe. It's that I haven't seen it. Well, or just an atheist? I guess my question, my question would be, um, how, like, what, what are you... What are you putting forward as supernatural? Uh, something that transcends the natural world. Well, for example. Yeah. What do you got? Uh, like, well, I'm not. I'm not proposing this. This is just a preemptive question before I get into something else. Right, but, but I need to know what you're not. talking about. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what supernatural right. means. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm just giving you an example. So a Platonic okay. form, for example, wouldn't be a god. So you could be an atheist while believing in them. So something like that is supernatural, but not a god. I think Wait, I, a what? I think I missed a word in there. Yeah, I did too. Like, like, a, pla like a platonic form. Like such as? I'm not familiar with the word, I'm like sorry. The, like the property of something that exists transcendent in another realm. Like what? What, <laughs> what does transcendent mean? Like, like numbers and abstract ideas. I believe in numbers. Like uh, I'm, I'm good with numbers. Yeah, but... Do you think numbers are supernatural? I don't no, think I'm saying that. they could be if you thought oh, they were <laughs> represented in Platonic ideals in a supernatural realm. I don't under. So, uh, do, are, can you give me an example of a supernatural number? No. Yeah, I, I don't think you're accurately representing what I'm asking okay. you. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm trying to understand. I'm not. I guess I'm not trying yeah. to represent okay. what you're like asking. Spirits, I'm, for example. What is, what a, is spirit? a spirit? Spirits. Hold on, hold on. I, I can't continue if I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, right, it's really important that I understand plan. you. What is a spirit? Okay, so, so, see, so uh, spirits, for example, they wouldn't be a god, but they could be something that's supernatural. But what's a spirit? And, and So an, an, an immaterial if it's, representation. If it's or, immaterial, or how do you know about it? Of, Okay, well, we can get to those questions. I'm just asking if you believe it or not. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I, I, mean, I guess we're, we're it, trying given to the default of <laughs> something that cannot be defined, do I believe it? No. If do you, you believe could, that yeah. something exists more than the material? And I'm saying, like, for example, 
And and I can't get an example. Yeah, I, I don't know what it means or more than the material. A platonic form or a spirit. I've given you two examples. But but we don't know what a spirit is. That's the problem. And when we when you give us a definition, I don't. That definition doesn't seem it's to. It's an immaterial substance that transcends our realm and holds person. Wow. I, I don't know Such as you, what? Right? Like, have, I'm just asking if you believe it or not. I don't know what that is because I I have no no frame of reference that includes a thing like that. So I don't know what you're describing. So so then you don't believe it then if you have no frame of reference. I guess I can't believe it, a thing believe if it. it does if it can't be meaningfully defined. Correct. I can't believe I, a yeah. thing. I just give you three. I just give you three attributes. No, you, you made th you immaterial gave us three words. Immaterial is not an attribute. It's a lack of. I mean, how, what what is you mean, immaterial? Like is that with like what you were talking about with the numbers? No, that, that was just an example for something else. But I'm just asking you. So, do you think okay, numbers are material? Do I think numbers are material? Are they well, real? No, they're obviously not material. So they're but immaterial. They could be, exist naturally. Well, right, but they don't exist as a substance or a thing. Well, if they did, then they'd be right. material, right? So those are immaterial. Well, is that, so is that what you're saying? The only thing that exists are abstract ideas and... Uh, I'm not saying anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying not... to understand what you're saying. So why don't you get to the part I'm, uh, after this that okay. maybe and see what happens. Okay, so I'm optimistic. I'm going to define, I I define what I think a god is, right? Okay. And then I'm... And then you can tell me if it qualifies as something you believe in or not. Is that fair? I guess, yeah. Let's sure. hear it. <laughs> Let's shoot. So I believe God is uncaused, timeless, How do you spaceless, know this? immaterial. Oh, I want to hear his definition. Okay. First. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, I believe that. <laughs> I believe that God is uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, extremely powerful entity that created the universe. Do you believe that exists? I don't even know how that would exist. Like, what? What? How are you even defining that. existence? How would it exist if it's not, if it's not really in? If it, like, in what way is it existing? Why do you believe this? Well, because I think that there's a good argument for it. But do you think you could answer whether you believe that but thing exists? Let's, I don't even know how you define existence if what you just described is what you would say fits into that definition. Let's pretend you well, believe it. I tried to establish if yeah. you think that only material things can exist. Well, no, I'm asking what do you, how do you define, like, like if something exists, how do you determine that? Like, how, what to you is considered to be existent? Logical arguments and reason and evidence. All right, so let, let's assume you believe what you said you believed. What is your yes. evidence? Okay, but can you just tell me if you believe that or not? My so position can, doesn't uh, affect your evidence. For, I'm not going to argue for something that you don't, that you could believe in, so just... He's basically saying if you believe it, there's no reason for him to make an argument. No, I think he's saying if I don't believe it, there's no reason to make no, an no, argument. No, no, he's saying if you don't believe it, there is a reason to make an what argument. What are you saying? No, I believe that thing exists. I believe okay. that is a god. You are an atheist. You do not believe in a god. Does that qualify as something you would determine to be a god? For the sake of argument, yes. Okay. C continue. So, Give us your evidence. Okay. So my argument is... How long is this show? Uh, Let him go. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Please continue. So... The, basically, the Kalam cosmological argument, but I, I reframe it in a different way. I told you. I told you. Sounds so familiar. Yeah, uh, I don't do arguments. I'm, I mean, Matt, that's more of a Matt thing. Uh, I consider arguments. You don't do arguments? I what consider them verbal for? masturbation. Yeah, I tend to yeah, say, just a bunch of words. at the end of the day, an argument to me is like a hypothesis. And yeah. then the question becomes, how are you going to test for it? You, so you, 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 you have... Presenting a formal logical argument. It That's fine, but, but and I'm, I'm assuming that. that at the end of your argument, the answer is, and so therefore, this thing that I just described exists and is a god. And so my yes, question, okay, yeah. so my, no, my question is, let's let's is, skip to the end. Okay. You've got this uh, this uh, concept now that is like this god that you just described as uh, having the attributes you described, and you've got you've yeah. you've explained a f let's let's just say you have, you ha gave a formal argument that you except as coming to that conclusion, and we've heard it, and we yeah. think, ooh, that's an interesting argument. Yeah. Now, how do we test to make sure that it's actually correct? It's not about, I'm presenting a logical argument. Yeah, right. we, 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 we've granted you. You're, you're, giving us, you're giving us the, the kind of the reason why you think that this, this thing 
for, but must be or could be, right? I mean, that's what this no, would come it's, down to. It's deductive. It's not even... Okay. Right. Not but at the end of the day, argument. it only matters if we can actually test to see if what you've concluded it, it is in reality there. It's a deduct Are you denying logic? No, no, I'm saying that if you, what you logic this, would everybody? provide you would be the reason for why you think this. But in order for us to test that it actually does correspond to reality, then we should have some method to test for it. So we get to the end of your argument. It sound, everybody says, wow, it really sounds like this makes sense. How do we make sure that it's actually true? Do you, you only believe in things that can be tested? Well, no, we have to confirm it. Don't you think that verifying what you believe is important? Yeah, that's why I have a premise for an <laughs> argument. So the, right. but, the conclusion we, is... But that's not verification. Yeah. For, for the moment, we're going to pretend I, that we agree with your argument. Okay. Just, just skip to the end. You've convinced I even us. I have it. Okay. You, you, that's but that's okay. We, you don't need to present it. You'll save us all half an hour. We assume that you're right, and your evidence... Your, no, your, your, your argument, argument has convinced us there is a God. What, what about it? What do we do with that? How do we, I'm how wondering, we how do we you, confirm You believe, it? because that's what a logical argument is, and that's so, evidence. But so I want to confirm, I, well, well, I want to confirm it, though, because this is very, you know, so this are, is... Confirm. Are you a deist? Yeah, are you a deist? Are you a deist? I, I would rather not get into that first. Like, you, you're, you're an atheist, so you don't believe in any sort of a god. All right, so pretend I'm a deist. A single god. I'm a deist. No, this is no. It's change your name to the deist experience, and then I'll call back in. All this, right. Well, if thanks. I show you that any sort of god exists, then I have falsified your position. So that's what I'm trying to do here. But what you're saying, though, is at the end of the day, if you think it's reasonable to believe a god exists, even if you have no way to verify that it's correct, you think that. It's, it's okay to just believe it. Yes, because it's the most reasonable conclusion. Okay, so you're, you're using the argument from it just makes sense to me. And no, that, I, I don't find that to be convincing. It has to be true. What? It, has, it has, to be, has to be true. I'm giving you two premises and a conclusion. The conclusion necessarily follows. Now, the premises could be unsound. That's entirely possible. But right. it, how it, would it, we it, know? It, how it, would we know that there isn't a problem with some of the premises if we can't test well, to make sure the conclusion is accurate? Let's, let, let me prove I can't. Them first, but if I can't you can tell me, <laughs> okay. yeah, you, you can talk about the premises if you want. I I don't do these. I don't so. understand how it would even matter. If, I mean, I could, I could say something that's completely reasonable that people in this room are like, yeah, that makes, just like, what, well, in fact, we actually went through this. It made sense to me to pay off my mortgage early because then I don't have a mortgage payment in retirement. And since I'll be, you know, be on a restricted income in retirement, I don't want to have to pay the mortgage. So it made sense to There's me. There's a difference between making <laughs> actions and believe, believing something exists or not, but okay? What that I'm trying to explain really to you is that all it took was for Phil to explain the math to me at and my dining evidence. room table to show me that, oh, there's other ways of looking at this that I didn't consider that actually may invalidate my prior mode of thinking. Okay, so give me those reasons. That's what philosophical What I'm saying is if we, is but what I'm saying is if you give your reasons and we agree with you, we still, all three of us, don't know if we're right. So it doesn't matter at the end of the argument unless we can really confirm it. So yeah, there's two premises and a conclusion. If, now if the premises are true, the conclusion is necessarily true, and it is reasonable to believe what's true. We can agree on that? Right, but what I'm saying is that just because we agree that, this, that what you would put forward makes sense doesn't mean that we're right. And if you were, it, if it you were makes, following that logic <laughs> and, and you wanted to convince us with this say. argument that there was a God, and we just jumped to the end and said, okay, there is a God, you still don't want to go on. I, I said, assume I'm you're right. You you, you, your argument, argument wins. There is a God. Now what? Okay, great. I've destroyed the show then. Thank you. So your position is falsified then. Okay, thank you for calling. Position's wrong. And it means nothing. So you're basically that's all saying you, that's there's all you've got. that nothing. What do you mean it means nothing? He what, just asked what you, do you what do that it? would mean. You, you've converted me to a deist. I believe in God. Now what? Okay. N now you're a more reasonable person. Oh, jeez. Goodbye. That's called. That's, where are we at? It's the. Is, is that it? Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, that's it. Wow. <sighs>
<laughs> just you know, I mean, if you're if there's a problem in your argument that we do not see, then when we get to the end of it and we all agree that the argument is correct, we can still be wrong. That's why verification is important. This is why when you have a hypothesis, you don't just stop and say, "Wow, that's a really good hypothesis. Let's just proceed as though it's true." You don't do that. You you have to be able to verify. There is no reason to. And what Phil is asking is, let's say that you hit the point where you can't verify and you have this idea that says, well, this seems to be pointing to this, but we can't test it, we can't verify it, so we don't know. So why should we lend belief to it until we can verify it? Why not just say, I don't know, there's this argument for it that sounds really good, but we can't test, so therefore I don't know until we can figure out and, a way to test. And of course, test. the inherent problem with that argument, of course, it's flawed, and Matt's much better at explaining that than I'm ever going to be, but even if you get to the point that there is a God, so has, what? Yeah, he has no attributes that <laughs> so it, it, it created he the universe. Or, it's like yeah. he's a God that, that exists in a way that doesn't yeah. exist. It's like he exists in a timeless, like, spaceless, someone once you know, asked he's powerful, me, but he's not really in this universe or whatever. He's someone not asked manifesting, me, said, uh, so what's the point? They said, Phil, how do you argue with a deist? And I said, why do you argue with a deist? I, I don't care. If you want to believe that, that's fine. It's as soon as you go to the oh next gosh. step when you think that I shouldn't teach about birth control in school right. that it becomes a problem. How are we doing? Um, let's see. So... Uh, let's see, we have now, oh boy, here we go. I'll, I'll, I'll take this, although it could get pretty complicated. We'll just see where this goes. Well, wait, we've got this one holding. So, um, all right, let me try this. Oh, good Lord. Do I really want to go down this path? We can always hang up. That's just, all right. I'll lean over and help They're you. They're suggesting I go with caller one. Let's see, this is Bob from Montana. Howdy, Bob. Hello? Hello? Can Is you that you? Are you Bob from Montana? Uh, not from Montana. <laughs> oh, they put you down as Montana. So we've got you down as Bob. Okay. Who? We, and so presuppositional apologetics, um, and are you promoting this line of apologetics or what? No, no, no I'm, I'm not here to argue about it. Okay. Or argue for Good, it. because there's no, it's I not mean, an argument. It's somebody saying God exists as a presupposition and prove it's wrong. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> well, there's different there's different things of it, but that's like site tens Bergen states yes, kind of thing. Yes, it is. You but, know how it's he juggles, he juggles with oh you have to believe him and this is how. Well, but um, okay, you're starting out on a good note because we're we're not going down that road. So what's on your mind? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, so are you would you count yourself as a, a naturalist? Oh man, we just had this question. There's a playbook, is it? Um, uh, we'll define naturalist. I'm late. I'm late. Yeah, that's all right. Late. That's all right. No, no. And they and they don't, they said that you can't hear the other callers when you're. What on do you mean by so. naturalist? Naturalist, um, uh, someone that does not believe in immaterial, uh, like abstract entities. Well, now see, the other guy used numbers, and we were like, well, that's kind of abstract, and we believe so in are, numbers. Are you? Well, I guess I uh, phrase it. Uh, are you well, asking of? Do I believe in anything that's supernatural? Issue. Would that be a fair re restatement but of your I question? But I don't know what that means. Well, I don't either. Well, 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 hold on. Supernatural, it can be, but that's just depending on your piece. Of, like, I'm confident you don't believe in supernatural. I don't know what right? it is. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, yeah, that's a tough one yeah. to answer. Yeah, so, can you give me an okay, example uh, of something that you're asking if we don't believe? Like, the hard question. Like, um, like laws of logic. We'll go with that. Okay. I accept the laws of we, logic. We, I'm a fan. Okay. Okay. And but but again, that that presupposition. So you don't look at laws of logic the same way I do. Do you deny so, the laws of logic? No. No, it's just okay. because of my presupposition. It's in a different. It's I look at it in a different light. I thought he was going to say realm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, what, it's what does it like, mean a different light? No, like, it's it's like the difference between it's like saying the universe exists and do you believe that it had a cause? And you'll say yes, and he'll say yes, but it's two different causes. Like yeah. you both agree that it has a cause, well, like, but different causes. And he's saying that the laws of like, logic, to a presuppositionalist, exist for different reasons than we would probably. Accept is that what you're saying, Bob? Okay, so is that a fair uh, framing? Example, like, I kind of thought it was a yes or no question. Like, I'm, I'm I'm not sure I follow now. For for example, like like what what I was talking about, different light. You you believe the laws of logic as in like a like a human concept where it was developed 
and it was tested and if it works it works and there there you go you got a lot of and with me i think we think in an image of god's thinking and that's why we have laws of logic but I, that's not what i'm here to argue about but uh well thanks for bringing it I up then. To, yeah i just want <laughs> i just wanted to know if you guys were naturalists or not um i wanted to ask you a question this is kind of interesting do you know the movie uh god is not dead sadly yes <laughs> you do <laughs> i just wanted to hear uh your guys's opinions on that because i just saw it the other day so uh it was hack cinematography I, 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 I had a great laugh watching it but uh what would you like to know about it me too <laughs> yeah i just want to i just wanted to know um uh what did you think about the arguments from both sides well i don't know what argument the christians made what was the argument the argument was I, the, like the whole the whole pivot point of that movie was really sad. It was um, the the atheist the atheist was sitting there and he said, "Yes, I hate God, I hate God." And then the theist said, "How can you hate something that doesn't exist?" And that was the whole pivot point for the atheist. That would be my question argument. to a person that says they're an atheist. I, I would I would ask that so, same question: How can you hate God and claim yeah, to be the, an the atheist? Yeah, the whole foundation of the movie. So it's to be it's basically atheist. a it's a <laughs> yeah. it's a straw man. It's creating an atheist that doesn't exist and then knocking him down and making him look silly. That's all the movie did. That's not a real atheist. I mean, an atheist yeah. is someone who is not convinced of God. That's yeah, it. Exactly. I can be a liberal or a conservative. So yeah, I, I agree that if you if you encounter an atheist who says I am an atheist and I really really I hate God and they're not specifically talking about yeah, a yeah. concept, um, that person may need to consider more deeply what they consider atheism to be. So what what do you believe, Bob? Kind of what we yeah, do so is what, what do you believe I'm a part in the Roman. I'm a, I'm a part of the Roman Catholic Church, and I, I believe in God because of the impossibility of the contrary. How do you know but, that? Um, that's that's uh, it's almost trivial for me to say. How do you know it's impossible? Well, I'm I'm not here to debate. So okay, that's, well, that's kind of a debate show. So <laughs> well, but I mean, to be fair, we also talk. We have discussions, <laughs> and um, okay. I just wanted to discuss that. All right. All right. Well, thank well, you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. All right. Have a good day. Thanks. Guys. You too. All right, I'm just going to make sure I'm, I'm dropping the right call. Yeah, I don't want to drop easy. the wrong person. So where are we at now? Boy, we're getting a big lineup here. So number, let's see, number five. And we have... So you thought the blinky thing wouldn't be helpful. That's really I, helpful. It's, I'm just looking at the numbers. Yeah, it's you, like, I'm so glad this stuff on. is numbered. So this is Connor from Scotland and wants to know if I believe in free will and why. And this is a huge topic, but it depends on how you define free will. So how are you defining right. free will, Connor? So I would start off by asking, what is the will and what is it free from? Um, to me, it would just be the f uh, freedom to act in accordance with your desires. Um, a lot of people have suggested that this they is are Connor. moved by yeah. the past. Oh, Hello? Okay. Hold on just a minute, Connor. I can hear you, but what's the question, Phil? Oh, it, it just sounds like a guy whose name starts with the letter Hamish. No, I don't. It does it. I don't know. But anyway, Connor, you're saying that. It, can't you, okay, so Connor, I can hear you. Let me just let me just reframe, and you tell me if I'm right. So you're saying that the way you would define free will is: can you act in accordance with your will without being like coerced by another agent? And that's what you would call free will. And you're you're comfortable with that definition? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm comfortable with that too, and yes, I think that I sometimes act in accordance with my will without being coerced by other agents. Right. Okay, well, well that's fine. Um, it's just that I'm personally a compatibilist, and I think that although determinism is true, it doesn't mean that there's no free will because I am essentially part of the determinism that's determining as an agent. Uh, I'm acting, you know, I'm not moved by the past. I just you know, live in the present. So um, another thing that I was going to bring up was what is your opinion on objective morality? Okay, and the question then becomes like, what are you, how are you defining objective morality? Because there's a couple different ways that people look at it. Yeah, Sam Harris would ha be an ethical naturalist and say that you can reduce oughts to statements about biology and value to brain states and things. Do you agree with that? The, now, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, are you an ethical naturalist like Sam Harris? Do you think that you can get moral oughts from biology, for example? 
I, I do think that you can reduce morality. Um, I, I think that it, it starts out with kind of trying to define what it is. So when I look at morality, I kind of look at the, the idea of what do social species use um, to, like when we test for morality in other species, for example, we look for certain metrics of things like, does this other species have uh, guilt? Do they have things like uh, oblig like uh, feelings of obligation or reciprocation? Um, are they altruism? Right. Yeah. Do they? Will they help each other? Like things that we would look at. Um, fairness. A sense of fairness is a big one. And there's like some studies that yeah. show that some species have a sense of fairness that is like much more rigid than other species. Like um, I remember reading about. I think it was dogs, and they said that the dogs would perform. And if you gave them both a treat, they would both seem to be appeased um, in the laboratory environment as long as they both got a treat. And it didn't really matter the quality of the treat. Now, when you, and, and I'm not talking about people at home doing this with your pets who know that the, this kibble's better than that kibble. I'm just saying the dog gets a treat in a lab, and he's happy, and it, he's not worried about what the other dog got. But when you get into primates, you start to see more of a, wait a minute, they got that treat, and I got this treat, and this treat is not that treat, right? So they have a, a more of a sense of fairness that is a little more complicated and gets more toward what we would look at as fairness. You know, we tend to look at, like, the quality of the treat. Um, and so I think that when you start to, first of all, we have to look at what are we calling morality and what are those metrics that feed into what we consider moral. And once you can look at other species and start testing for things like this, you are beginning to define what you categorize as moral in a, I guess what you're saying, a biological sense, right? I mean, that would feed into the biological concept of morality. Correct. But to me, there's, there's, no, there's no ultimate grounding why we ought to prefer the innate uh, values that our biology gives us, although it's just a fact of our behavior that we do. Okay, now wait, wait, that's a different question, because now what you're basically saying is, I don't know that there's um, a requirement for me to go with that morality, right? Like, so there's a question, first of all, of whether or not there is this thing called morality, and I say that, yes, they, they are looking at it and defining it in a biological way, because otherwise... What are you talking about, right? You've got to understand the influence that is driving this thing that we're calling morality. And once you have that understanding, right. you can start reducing it a bit. And I, I don't think that it necessarily comes to the conclusion that in a particular situation, there is like one best option. Sometimes, like in my job, for example, there are ways to do things that are, almost, that are equally as good. You could have several ways to do it that are going to work out to be just as cost effective, just as time effective, just as, and so there could be multiple moral ways of handling even the same situation that are equally as good. I don't think that there's necessarily a best number one way to do something, even if it turns out that you could reduce it in that way. Now, what you're saying is, I don't know that the biological imperative toward those drivings in a person or in another species are something that, from a, from a cognitive perspective, I need to necessarily accept as how I ought to behave. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. Yeah. And so I understand what you're saying. And I think that's an interesting question. Because it's a common fallacy, the naturalistic fallacy or appeal to nature, that just because something's natural it doesn't make it good. Um, Correct. And also this idea of trying to derive an ought, what you should do. Do you, would you agree, you know? would you agree that these tendencies, these moral tendencies that we were just describing that might be tested for in another species, would you agree that those tendencies do lend themselves to social bonding, like efficiency in social species? That those are the types of things yeah, that allow us to bond and, and have a society? Yeah, practically. Like, right. we generally apply... Well, yeah, like I, I totally respect ethical naturalism in that sense. I think it's as good as you're going to get. But um, just it's just a, a, a kind of a result of metaphysics, if you like, that there, that there, there can't be any kind of, um, you can't really derive an ought from an is. But, but Sam Harris thinks that that's, you know, just uh, it's not really that important or big of a deal. Well, I guess my question die. is, <laughs> would you want to see the breakdown of society? And in right. my book, these things are really, really big when it comes to keeping people socially 
connected and con I, I hate to use the word controlled. It's not controlled in a negative way, but controlled in a way that allows us to network and connect and to actually build social, uh, socially positive things. Now, to be fair, those same types of con connections can allow us to build socially negative things, right? I mean, we could go off and start uh, limiting or directing those things in a way that it appeals to maybe some segment of society against another segment of society. And we see things like that, right, where people will start saying something like um, they, they get afraid of somebody who's gay or afraid of somebody who's trans, and so they start feeling like they're doing good by persecuting these people. And so you can actually use these same sort of things as like, you know, I want to protect other people and I'm doing that by harming this other group because I have this irrational fear. So it's weird how it can be misdirected as well. So I would say that in your, even in your question, even if somebody accepted that you know, these things are helpful metrics, they're also like any tool could be misused to, and misdirected in a way that makes them harmful. Yeah, just the, the, the guy that called in just last, or the two last callers that brought up naturalism. Mm -hmm. Naturalism is actually the belief that everything can be studied or potentially studied under the natural sciences. So it's got nothing to do with immaterialism because that's idealism. You know, materialism and idealism, you can still be a naturalist and be either. So like naturalism, uh, it just means that, well, only the natural world exists and that's what can be, I guess, fall under the domain of natural science, whatever that is. I mean, that's right, right. not big But I guess I, I, I have a little bit uh, better understanding of what you're describing, because what you're basically saying is that which can be studied, like that which can be observed and actually studied in a, in a way that gives right. us information and meaningful feedback, right? I mean, is that, about, is that fair? It was, also, it was also the reason why materialism became physicalism, because waves are not material, but they're still under physics, and they're still natural. So it's like naturalism is the broader uh, set. I feel, I feel like your definition is more useful, definitely, because the other one was, like you were saying, you, you could throw out numbers, and numbers are not material, and yet, you know, there they are, right? We use them. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Me methodologically. <laughs> all right, well, I'll tell you what. I've, I want to, first of all, say thank you very much for your call. We do have a lot of Our lines are full. But I really want to thank you. I feel like your That's contribution great. was very interesting this week. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Bye -bye. Okay, so who do we have next? Um, all right, so we've got... Okay, uh, we'll take... Jake from Virginia. Hi, Jake. Hi, it's uh, great to be on the show. Oh, well, thank you for calling. What's Good on your you. mind this week? So I have a quick spiel, and uh, I'd just like to go through without interruption, if you don't mind. Uh, we'll try. We, 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 how long is the spiel? Yeah, I, I'm not I'm sure. I like <laughs> spiels. Uh, do you have a question? or do you... 45 seconds. Okay, not, we, not we will sit tight for 45 seconds. You go. Yeah, not a big deal. So I have one key issue with the spread of atheism, and in particular to the youth. And as a Christian, I find that atheism spreads really infectiously due to kind of the nihilist intent of a lot of people around my age, which is in high school. And I'm a strong believer in Christ, and I feel as if the Lord helped all of us. And being with peers that are also in the Lord helps me a lot in particular. I found that due to the notion that waiting for sex till marriage being a sin makes it just that much easier to have anal. And I really just am all about that. What, what is know? atheism? Wait, 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 let him go. God. Oh, God. Let him go. I'm and sorry. I'm just curious how you can refute that. Like, How I can refute so that? <laughs> Wait a minute. So, not I, that, I not that there's anything wrong with that. So, what you're saying is that <laughs> let me let me just uh, you know, let's let's go with this for like a minute. Okay. okay so, <laughs> what you're saying then I is that the if food, somebody so, uh, says you you can't have like you know uh, penile vaginal sex until marriage, that there's going to be these other outlets that come for like like that. It's that the Catholic girls are wild model, right? Like, because they're doing all these things, but, and, well, and no, no pun intended. And so what, what you're saying is it leads to um, more creative sex, and that seems like a good thing. Is that a fair framing? I, I can't well, imagine I that's mean, what he's yeah, saying. No, absolutely, because, I mean, you know, the whole concept of Virgin Mary and stuff and making it, you know, that much easier to not do it in the vagina and just go in the butt, right. and it's just that much better. I, I and and, and let me tell you, there's probably a lot of people that are with you on this. <laughs> But I'm going to say, to say, just to throw this out here, and I, this may be difficult to believe, because you were talking about high school level, and so I'm going to 
make maybe an incorrect assumption that you're kind of young. But believe it or not, there are some people who are not into that. I, I know it's... You're, no, you're crazy. You're I know, crazy. No, I know tough it's tough. tough. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. No, that's actually a lie. I'm not sure Jake's a real caller. No, I'm not sure either. Saying. But uh, I, I do appreciate the laugh, Jake. Jake has too much free time on his hands. <laughs> Thank you for calling. Idle, idle hands. You did get on the show, so feel free to tell your friends. Thanks. <laughs> Highlight of his life. Okay, so this is... Who's next here? We, they're telling me. Now, and I want to say, you know, just to, just to kind of redeem the screeners. I have been going with the screeners. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that. And it's, it's working. So, so here we go. Um, we're looking at... Okay, so this one is, I keep saying okay, I apologize, it must be annoying. Um, if you're a grammar Nazi. Tate in Missouri oh. City, Texas. Oh. Hi, Tate. Hello, Hello Tate. Hello, Tate. Hello, Hi, what's on your mind this week? <laughs> well, oh my God, this, this has been a weird show. I'll admit, oh, like, yeah. this episode has just been weird. It's me because it's, it's me, yeah. it's me. Phil brings that out of people. See, some people like to have those yes, philosophical I debates. I, I yeah. just got my thing. Oh, yes. But Anyways, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I am an atheist. Mm -hmm. I have, I have, can I, can I say a story and then I'll ask my question? Yeah, why not? We've been doing All like right. a free flow show. It's been working well, so. <laughs> All right. I just, I just, <laughs> I don't, I can't even articulate words. Right now, yeah, isn't that crazy? I believe you. So, I have that. I was just I'm telling so, Phil I have that problem yeah. yesterday. So tell us a story, Tate. What's going on? Yeah, tell me a story, a good one. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it's kind of just like you know, I've been, I was a Christian up until I was seventeen or so, mm -hmm. and then I actually went the deist route. Okay. I thought it was pretty interesting that we were talking about it earlier, or those guys were talking about it earlier, and so then you know the whole concept of it is kind of what made it unravel to me. Like, yeah. it, you know, it's a God that allegedly <laughs> is out there in motion, but like that, that's just it. He doesn't get involved with anything. So like if, if I can't even prove it, how could I prove it to myself? You know, right. if I can't prove it to you, it reminds it me, yourself, then why does it even matter? I wanted, there's this little poem I heard once when I was little and it stuck with me. It says, when I was going up the stairs, I met a man who wasn't there. He was not there again today. I wish that man would go away. And that's kind of like uh -huh. the conundrum that you come out with when you're, I went through the same thing you're describing, where you're trying to figure out what is God to me. And then by the time you get there, you're like, it's kind of like the man who wasn't there and he wasn't there again today. I wish that man would yeah. go away. And you're getting all confused and you're going, what does it even mean to be there and not be there? Like, this is crazy. Yeah, it seems a little... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then, okay, so you had, you told your story. You, that's how you oh. uh, deconverted, well, yeah. right? Yes. Okay. And um, I was also going to add that right now, I, I'm sort of, like, helping sort of advocate atheism in my community to okay. a degree, or, like, in a way. Because sure. I'm, I'm allowed to wear a necklace that says I'm an atheist, at my workplace. I work at a grocery store. I bag your groceries and I push your carts around. Great. And, and people, you know, the people like it. Like they haven't, the store hadn't gotten any complaints. I'm allowed to do it. And I've actually had people approach me who said they were atheists and that I made their day by being Aww. sort of open about it. That is fantastic, Tate. I, I support and, anyone and everyone doing that. Yeah, because that's a really unobtrusive way to do it. You know, you've got your little piece of jewelry. You're not shoving it in anybody's face. You're not, you know, saying, you know, Yeah, I don't, anything. I don't mention it at all. Yeah. Anybody who's ever mentioned it was not me. Yeah, so you're just like, this is about me and not about y'all. And, yeah, no, yeah, I think exactly. that's nice. So I've, I've been doing that for a couple of months, and I didn't even have what I would call a hiccups with anybody until I'd say two days ago because and this I don't know whether this is funny or sad or more funny or more sad because I find it a bit of both okay so I was I was out on the lot and this elderly woman she she asked if she could borrow me for a moment because she needed help loading some soda into her car you know because okay. she's not physically able yeah, to yeah no I get you <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, I'm like, yeah, absolutely, because I'm a nice guy. I like to help the people out whenever I can. And that's, that's kind of your job, thing. right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, was, I wasn't I was wearing the jewelry that day, though. Okay. Like, just so, you know, she just, 
she just thinks I'm, she probably just assumed I was a Christian or something. Sure. And so I, I go up, I load it up for her. She, she tells me how happy and thankful she is. And then she finished it off by saying, God bless you. God bless you, yeah. And so. Did you say I didn't sneeze? And, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that wasn't a sneeze. I. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I didn't say that, though. Normally, of course, I would, I kind of just let it go with most people. But just for that, I kind of made a little gesture showing that, you know, I'm not exactly a believer. Okay. Like, I ain't, I verbal about it. I just kind of like made a half and half hand symbol. Yeah, and, okay. But kept smiling. I never, her, her smile, she lost her smile immediately and oh. changed. Like she asked, she asked me again, she's like, have a good evening? Like, is uh. that going to be better for you? <laughs> well, that's cool and, that she readjusted it. I know. Very nice. But then, then I asked, then I told her, I hope you have a good evening as well, man. So I turned, I turned around <laughs> to go back into the store. I heard her moan, oh, God, as she got into her car. <laughs> well, it's hard like, for older people, I think. I, I know. No, I, know. I mean, they, they, they grew up in an entirely other world where there wasn't this diversity. People that didn't agree with them just basically kept their mouths shut. You, and you know, and so when now them having to deal with it is not something they're used to, it, and they don't know, know quite how to handle it. So, I mean, at least she adjusted her message. I mean, some people would have got nasty. I, and don't get me wrong. I guess maybe I'm being too, uh, you know, making too much of an apology for her. Uh, but I think she was very nice. Yeah. I, but, I mean, there's some people yeah. that would say the assumption, the blanket assumption that somebody would appreciate that is, like, you know, not okay. So I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, being too appalled. But, I, yeah. but I, do, I do understand sometimes how, it, how a person has to take time to readjust to new realities, especially when they've spent, like, an entire lifetime um, in a particular reality. It can be hard to wrap your brain around the new situation. Right. I, I understand. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware that things were different. In fact, but in fact, pretty much every single person who came up to me and told me they were atheists has like brought up the point that a uh, atheist used to be executed in Texas. So oh, really? I, I I wasn't here then. So. It's been a while. Yeah, I, didn't, <laughs> I, don't know. I wasn't. I'd have to look I that one up. That either, and I'm I'm not sure if that's 100 percent true. But I, 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 I hadn't heard that one it. yet, but um, a, a I haven't looked group. into it. <laughs> okay. Of different age groups, two people completely different ages have told me that that used to happen. I don't know if that's yeah. true, but well, now yeah, I've got something to Google me. after that's the right. show. We'll be well. This will be the dinner thing. Like, oh, is you know, did anybody yeah, find that, anything? All right. That just reminded me that that's something I should Google too. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for well, calling. Well, thank you for your call. No, wait, wait, wait. Oh. I didn't, I didn't get my question. Well, what's your question? <laughs> Sorry, I, I got really wrapped up. That's it all right. Was, um, throw down your throw it down. What do you got? All right. Why? Why do you guys believe that religions are keeping their mostly their most sought off, sought after contradictions in their texts? Because I I have an idea, but I was I was wondering if you guys had any idea. Well, I I think for Christianity, the the issue is. Well, and, and I think for to some degree Islam too. I mean, yeah, once there, you there aren't contradictions. Once you, well, yeah, that's yeah. there. I mean, but, I just got converted well, a half I guess hour ago. What so. he's saying is, why wouldn't you just edit them out entirely? Because they're, they're not contradictions. <laughs> well, they've come to that, but he's saying if you were editing this thing all this time and there was any kind of problem, why wouldn't you just fix it? Well, I, I, I think you're just predisposed to believe that this has to be truer than human truth. This is God's truth, and if you allow yourself to edit it. You're admitting there's a mistake. Right, but there was hundreds of years of editing. So I think what he's asking is, if you have all this time to edit, why wouldn't you just edit out the stuff that's obviously going to cause you trouble down the road? And yeah, what? Right. Right, right now. So, but what happens is, at some point, they had this established, which is funny because they had the established canon, right? But then you have an established Western uh, Protestant canon. You have the Eastern Orthodox established canon. You have the Catholic <laughs> established canon. It's like all these established canons that have all these different books in them. Well, some different books in them. But, but as far as, uh, at some point, somebody came up with the idea that this thing is set in stone. Right. 
and it's it's the word of God and you don't change it. Now, whenever that happened, I think they got a little stuck. And if you if you pay attention though, they they do still change it, right? Like they'll go in and there's like um versions of the Bible that are a lot less problematic like oh, yeah, in the way they translate them. Uh and it's just an interesting thing. I I I guess for me, though, and, and for the current time frame, it's probably just an issue of too many people believing that this is now the orthodoxy, um, even though the orthodoxy even changes from generation to generation, not even hundreds and hundreds of years, but you know, from what one generation believes to what the next generation believes within the same congregation um, of, of churches is going to be altered. It's very weird because oh, yeah. it's it's dynamic, right? And it's organic, and everybody from the outside, when you step back, can see mm -hmm. it. And yet, it, the people that are in that church are just like, no, it's never changing. It's the word of God. Um, that was a big mm -hmm. deal to me when I was younger. That was part of what deconverted. Well, it didn't deconvert me uh, from theism, but it deconverted me from Christianity. Was when I started to realize the process that the Bible went through to become the Bible. And I was like, wow, there's a lot of people <laughs> making decisions here. And I'm not seeing God. I'm seeing a lot of people <laughs> making decisions. And then at the end of this process, I'm being told, now it's God. And I'm like, wow, no, I don't think that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, because I think that the problem is that, you know, had they been fixed way, 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 way long ago, there would have there would actually, you know, have to be a debate over whether or not this stuff is actually viable. Or well, what's actually, odd, what's odd though, is that they you know, did anything. fix parts of it, right? So there's certain books where they added yeah. things and where they took things out, like the story of the adulterous woman is is a in later interp interpolation, right? It, it's not in the older texts. It's not in the more um, the texts that are assumed to be the most. Uh, you, you know, you, you're always having to, to, to make educated guesses about the original text, but the, the adulterous woman is put yeah. in, and they're basically saying that this was probably added in order to give Jesus a more softer side, because up until that, he was very, very um, law-driven, rigorous defender of the Old Testament and going in and beating the money changers out of the temple. And so then they did this little thing where he basically says, even though the law says to execute her, um, let's not execute her because we need to be more forgiving. And that's like a whole other dimension of Jesus. And that story is so often referred to because it does demonstrate the side of Jesus that you don't often see. And that was added, you know, in order to help out a little bit. And, and you have other things where people have made changes to the text in order to make them reconcile a little bit better. But then you're right. There's these other parts where it's like, why wouldn't you just go in and tweak that one too, right? I mean, you're in there tweaking. Why not tweak this? The amazing thing is that with all of those <laughs> oh, problems. Oh, they were definitely tweaking. Yeah. <laughs> with all those I problems, thought of that after I said yeah, it. With all those problems yeah. and errors, we still have to have a TV show to debate it. So it's staggering. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah, good question, Tate. So now... And now, because they didn't fix it, I believe they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because you've got the people who you know, were pointing out these inconsistencies and slowly began to, you know, oh. convert the populace, or at least a portion of them based on the scriptures. Or they could, you know, go in, edit, somebody would notice, then everybody would catch on. That would yeah, you can't really fix it, cards. but I saw a really good quote on Phil's. Uh -oh. Facebook page recently where he said that, you know, the answers to these contradictions don't have to be good. Uh -huh. They just have to be good enough. Yeah. And he's right. Yeah. When I was a believer, when I was a Christian believer, I could hear somebody point out something to me that was so obviously contradictory. And I would go in and then they would give me this like convoluted explanation for why it didn't contradict. And then at the end of it, it was like, oh, good, I don't have to reevaluate my entire belief system because they've got this answer. Yeah, the Bible can only be understood <laughs> if read in its original Romulan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very good thing that I went out and I got myself a physical copy of the Skeptics Annotated Bible, King James Version. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's got to be fun. All right, Tate, we've got a few more. we got some more calls. We've got some lines. Thanks, Tate. And um, we do thank you for yeah. your call this week. It was fun chatting with you. And hope you oh, have a you great much. rest of your fun weekend. With you too. Okay. Bye bye. Oh, my God. Thank you. Bye. Sure. Bye. It reminded me I was in a little gas station in Arkansas and I bought some stuff. And the total was $3.34 and I gave the lady a 10. 
math joke for you. Christian math joke. You're not a math person. All right. So 334, I gave her a 10. She puts the 10 in the register, and the change is 666. Oh. And so she just about freaked out and wanted to know if I want to take something off my order or buy a piece of five-cent gum to change the total. I'm like, no. I want you to give me 666. And I went out in my car and laughed hysterically. Almost went back in and bought the same stuff again, even though I didn't need it. Just, <laughs> just for fun. Just keep buying it. Yeah, I mean, go to and stop at every 7-Eleven. Well, see, the yeah. problem is that religion leads to crazy ideas, and crazy ideas lead to crazy actions. So, it's a, it's a problem. Superstition. Superstition. It's like supernatural. And where is the evidence? I haven't, I haven't heard it yet. No. All right, you want to do another one? Yeah, we got some. Let's see. Um, let's go with, we'll just keep going with the screener choices here. All right. So we have Joey in New York, New York. Hi, guys. How are you? Hi, Joey. How are you? We're doing um, good. Tracy, I'm good. I'm good. Um, it's really great to talk with you, Tracy and Phil. It's nice to meet you. Oh, thank you. Piacere. Um, so I've been on the, the, the discussion board a little bit there, having a little bit of a debate <laughs> with a fellow atheist. Okay. I happen to be an atheist. Um, however, I have been doing a lot of research into um, the intelligent design movement. And I do hold a strong contention against my other atheists about whether the theory is scientific or not. Okay. Um, I happen to think it is. Most think it's not. Okay. And I just, my question to you is, why do you feel like this, the theory is scientific and... I don't. Or isn't scientific? Why do you feel it's not scientific? But I wanna, before you start, I think Phil would like to respond to this one, but I want to just ask, have you seen the Nova Dover trial coverage? Like, did you watch the, I the series? I have seen that, yes. Okay, where they I looked did. at, they actually looked at the, the scientific papers that were submitted for... Uh, on behalf of the the side of the argument that was saying that intelligent design should be considered a scientifically valid position, correct? Okay, yeah. So they looked at that in, in, in the court to, to try to determine whether or not this could be taught in a science classroom as, as scientifically valid. And they did look at the research that was submitted um, by uh, things like irreducible complexity, for example, they looked at that, and they had actually, um, and I'm, I, I, mean, I apologize, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but the, but the, the scientist who pioneered um, that idea, uh, I don't know that he invented it, I don't know if he did or not, but he wrote about it. Michael um, Behe. Yeah, and so he, he got up and, and testified as well, and he is certainly credentialed, yep. um, and still it was rejected. And okay. you, you did watch well, this, you're saying. Well, Joey, I, I, I've got a couple questions yeah. for you, if I may. Okay. Go for it. Do you know who the designer is? No. Okay. Uh, how do you falsify your theory? By um, comparing things that are not designed with things that we know are designed and making predictions. Well, wait a moment. If, wait a minute. Uh, are you saying, though, that the universe is designed? No. Okay, then what, how are you um, defining intelligent design? Specific. Yes, please. Yeah, so intelligent design, as I understand from, let's go with one book that I recently just finished, which is Stephen Meyer's Signature in the Cell. Um, he defines ID as the um, theory that some features of life uh, are best explained by intelligent causation. Okay, so who's, That's, who's the agent? What is the agent? I and how, I would, don't how know. would you? Okay, fair enough. I like. I don't know. That's a really good answer. Uh, but the question is, how would you falsify that? Because that, at this point, it's just a claim. So, so yeah. So I would think that um, a way to falsify it would be studying things that uh, studying objects that we know are not designed. What would um, that be? And then when we go, I'm sorry. What would that be? Because if if uh, life is designed in some way, like a rock. Okay. Would we know that a rock like, is not designed? Uh, I mean, we would have to if we were to give forensics or archaeology any credit. But we give, don't we give biology credit and they say life is not designed? Um, well, I guess we... we there's, but are they saying it's not designed? I mean... Well, evo you evolu be, unless you're calling evolution... Could evolution be a designer, in your opinion? It could be, yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> I, I can work with that. Um, 
However, I think that it, ID or the idea that an intelligent cause perhaps, and this book that I just read has nothing to do with evolution, so to speak. It has to do with the chemistry involved in DNA. I have a question. The guy, um, the guy who wrote the book, I'm assuming, has also written probably papers, right? Research? Yeah. Okay, and so he's produced research to, that is in the same vein as what he's putting forward in this book. Is that correct? And I'm asking. I don't he know. He is... No, no, yeah, his name is Stephen Meyer. Right. You can look him up online. For sure, no, I'm... Um, okay, so he, uh, he's not a scientist. He's not a biologist. Um, he is a philosophy of science uh, PhD. Okay. Does, um, he, does, so he, he does he have scientists or researchers that are also in support of his perspective? He does have, science, he does have scientific papers along with... Um, uh, biology papers and and things okay. all throughout his do book. Do the authors to, to do the him. authors of those papers agree with his interpretations of their work? Like, does their conclusion do the conclusions in the papers describe what he interprets them to be saying? Yes. Okay, so you're saying um, that there are biologists. I would say that there are perhaps. Go ahead. Uh, hold on one second. Sure. I'm go sorry. ahead. No, you please um, go. There. Yeah, there might be um, maybe a study or two where uh, Myers didn't summarize the study appropriately. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I, I haven't really looked at any of the criticisms, uh, too many of the criticisms. I just know that most of the criticisms, especially on Amazon, don't even address the main topic of the book. But um, I, what I found is he, he appropriately summarizes things found in, like, information theory. He okay. uh, looks into biology. He Right. What I'm what... trying to get to, though, is at the end of a of a research paper, there's a there's an area for the conclusion where the where the researchers actually describe what they believe their findings represent and what they don't represent. So here's what we found. Here's what we didn't okay. found. And here's what we think it it means. And what I'm trying to get okay. to is is the, is is Myers when he cites these papers, is he going for information in the paper and then using it for his own conclusion? Or is he actually looking at the conclusions of the researchers? Are the researchers themselves saying, we believe that there's an intelligence involved based on our findings? No, no. I don't think there would ever, there's ever a... And I'm just asking, again, I'm not, I, haven't, I haven't looked at this, and I, I can't even assume that you would have gone and looked up every single piece of research that he, that he cites in a book. I'm not going to hold you yeah. to something like that. Well, but, uh, but I am going to say, say that it, it's important to look at how he's interpreting their research versus how they interpret their research as the researcher. And there's also a situation where you sometimes have somebody that gives an interpretation at the end of a piece of research, and then the peer group that is reading this paper comes out and says, we think that your conclusions as the researcher are problematic, right? So one example of that was yeah. a study where um, they found that people who went to church regularly were healthier. And so there was a lot of discussion in the paper about, you know, why would church make people be more healthy? And somebody else said maybe people who are more healthy can go to church more as opposed to somebody who's bedridden or chronically ill and maybe they don't get out as much. So it could just be a correlation between someone going to church and being healthy enough to get there and to actually be there in, so, for a couple hours. I, I'm just, I'm sorry that this is taking like a long segue, but I just want, the other issue is you have people, are you familiar with um, Deepak Chopra? No. Okay, well, he, he's a guy who's kind of famous for philosophizing about physics in a way that he puts it into layman's terms, but then he twists it very badly to where people who are hearing it get these very strange metaphysical concepts and, and ideas about odd things that really are not what the physicists would be supporting. So he, he, yeah. he, he when, once the research gets filtered through Deepak Chopra, it comes out very different than what the studies themselves were claiming. And so I would so think... Can, I just, can yeah. I just ask you a real quick question, though? Sure, go ahead. I've been going um, on. When it, comes to, when it comes to the evidence in a paper, you, you do agree that in conclusions or implications from that research can be different, right? Obviously. People look and see that okay. in them in different ways, but you can also make a case for why certain interpretations are not as good. So when the people were saying mm -hmm. we need to find out why church makes people healthier, it was very yeah. important for somebody to say, did you evaluate whether or not the people who didn't go were already sick? 
because that would make a big difference, right? I mean, that would change yeah, yeah. it a lot. And if you didn't consider that as a con as a com what do they call it a, a confounding factor in your research in in the people that you studied, then you might have a big problem here because you're assuming that going to church somehow is fostering good health where this uh, where the reality might be that people who have good health go to the church more um, and so so okay. uh, you can see the criticism and you can say yes that's a valid criticism of this finding and of the researchers interpretation if they didn't check for that that would be a problem yeah so what I did see in the book is essentially Myers used an argument from a biology uh, article, like either published in Nature or something like that, mm -hmm. he um, said why the conclusion of the of the scientists was probably incorrect, and then pr proposed his own conclusion, which was like, for instance, if you want to talk about homology in biology, mm -hmm. and I think this is a different book that I've read. He says why um, homology in biology could be equally used as a evidence for design or a common designer instead of common descent. Okay, but here's the problem. In order for this to be, yeah. con you're asking, what your question is, is why isn't this considered valid scientific theory? And yeah. he would have to convince the scientific community that what he is presenting is valid in their opinion as the people who basically are the arbiters as the folks who do the research and who evaluate the research and who are the best qualified people that we have to evaluate the best evidence, they are the ones that kind of determine whether or not this constitutes a scientifically valid position that, for example, could be taught in a school. And you'd have to be able to show that's falsifiable. Right. And, and I mean, I understand what you were talking about earlier about we could do comparisons and things, but this has to be agreed to by the community of peers of the group who are considered expert in this area. That would, be, that would be who he needs to convince. So in other words, Meyer convincing you or convincing me and Phil would not make this scientifically mm -hmm. valid. He has to influence the community of peers in the scientific community. Well, I don't, I just, I feel, and I, I guess I'll conclude on this because I know the show's ending in a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, the, I don't know if I would consider, especially reading all the criticism that I have seen about the ID movement, that um, they that the ID advocates really get a chance, especially in the sense that Stephen Meyer, Stephen Myers was the person who tried to publish his findings in of like saying that this is a really clear indicator of design, and uh, the Smithsonian Institute rejected his paper, mm -hmm. claiming some things like it wasn't peer reviewed, blah 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 blah, right. but. Um, so there was this whole thing that happened, and it was in fact published in 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 the peer reviewed journal and then was it it had like over like a hundred or thousand scientists writing in and saying ID is not scientific mm -hmm. why did you play why did you post it or publish it in our paper okay. when if if you can't if you can't publish a scientific hypothesis because it's already considered not scientific, how exactly would Peer review okay, but you're assuming. Okay, scientific. you're assuming that they're saying it's non-scientific because they've got a pre-assumption that it is. But you're, but if they looked at the paper, and they say this is not science, this man is not doing science, then it okay. could also be that the paper is criticized because it really isn't up to snuff for that community's standards. There's a man okay. named Stephen Lavarge. Um, and he did sleep and dream studies, and he's written about it. He's a little bit promotional, so I'll just give you a heads up and a warning. But he wrote a really good yeah. book about his experience and how he tried to publish again and again and again something that he believed was very valid and accurate, and he was rejected. He couldn't come and speak at symposiums. They wouldn't publish his paper. And every time they kept saying, how do you... How do you know this is what you think it is? Like you're not really showing us how you're going to demonstrate this. He he believed in something called lucid dreaming, which is being awake when you're in a dream, and being consciously yeah. aware that you're in the dream. And he had had that experience, and he had, you know, historic uh, records of people that describe the same experience, and people living today that they say that they have the capacity to do this, and yet they were saying, how do you know you're not dreaming that you're aware that you're dreaming? And after struggling to get this published and struggling to do uh, symposiums talks, he finally got it 
and said, how do I know that I'm not just dreaming I'm awake in a dream as opposed to being awake in a dream? How would I know? And he actually devised experiments to go in and test for this and he validated his hypothesis through those experiments and now lucid dreaming is considered to be a valid, um, you know, like a real thing in dreams that you can do and, yeah. they, and they can show that people are conscious during that dream state and you can test them and they can give you feedback while they're dreaming. And so it's, uh, he, he, he did a good job, finally. And when he was able to demonstrate it, now he does his papers, now he does his talks, now he's, he's validated, right? And so okay. for, for a long time, now he was, he was correct in his belief before, but he didn't really have it scientifically validated until later. And so the scientific community wasn't worried, they, weren't, they had no way to know if he was right or not. And they were basically telling him, you're not really giving us the information that allows us to determine if you're correct or not correct. And if we get, let you get up here and talk about this, we don't even know if this is an actual phenomenon. And how do you know? And he didn't. And so he, he made it his task to demonstrate that it was, and, or to at least test to see if he was right, because he began to doubt himself, which is the way that you should go at it. You should say, am I right? How would I know I'm right? And how would I demonstrate this to someone else? If this guy Myers, okay. I mean, he, he may have a, a good point, and he may be correct in what he's doing, but it has to be up to snuff. Okay. Does that make um, sense? I would love to talk more about <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'd love to talk more about it if I can speak next Next week, I know that this is the I end won't of the be show, hosting, so be hosting. yeah, uh, uh, you can try. Um, you can give them a call and see how it goes. Thanks, Joey. Yeah, yeah, thank you for calling. Appreciate right. your call. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, bye. And we do. Uh, we're, we're a little bit, like, just a couple minutes past, but we have, I'm going to say, since they, they don't have any other calls, this is our last call. Last There's no call. more calls. Don't take any more calls. And we're going to go and see here Tom from Oceanside, California, which by the way, Tom, I have been to Oceanside, California. It was very nice. Yes, it is. It's a wonderful place to be. <laughs> so what's on your mind? What's going on, Tom? Well, well I, Phil, uh, I like you on there. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, we all like Phil. So. I think I'm never going to come back after the... <laughs> they're going to boot me off the show. <laughs> okay, well, don't do that. <laughs> uh, Tracy... Uh, I'm infatuated with you, and what I was hoping you guys could help me with was in speaking to a theist friend of mine who claims that God sent her here from England, wow. uh, and she proclaims what's a miracle and what isn't. Oh. I proposed to her as, yes, she, last night, the other night at a dinner, she says, oh, that was a miracle, and I asked her, well, that's not that big a thing. Aren't miracles reserved for exciting things? She still said, no, it was a miracle, but I digress. Uh, I asked her, why would her God let little children suffer and die, say, in Africa or wherever there's, you know, strife? And she said, well, that's because men have free will. Free will, yeah. Now, see, so why uh, do they die in earthquakes? Still free will. I mean, it's always free will. But now, see... <laughs> I would be... Earthquakes must have free will. So I'm, God I'm, can't a, I'm a little more snarky of you may have figured out by this episode. Uh, I would tell her that <laughs> God talks to me, and he said that that was not a miracle. Oh, and well, now, he already knows I'm an atheist. Right, but he's, he's, you, you've been converted. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you're still an atheist, but God talked to you, and God said that's not a miracle. And she goes, well, that's silly. You can't just claim that. Really? You can. Why can't I? So and then, then you make it about the, the logical process of, of faith or blind faith or is it valid to communicate with God? And why is your inability to communicate with God or your ability to communicate with God any less likely than hers? And now you're talking about a whole different process and you're talking about how the mind works, how people think. And you know, yes. it's like a Ken Ham's famous thing was when he talked about uh, historical science. He says, well, you there... And I always, when yeah. someone brings that to me, I always say, yes, I was. And that's not how it happened. And they go, well, you couldn't have been there. And I go, based on what? And now they want us to talk about evidence. Surprise. <laughs> so I just flip it on their head and I would say, God talked to me and he said it wasn't a miracle. Right. But what your question is, it says here, is how to deal with free will as an excuse for allowing suffering. Right. And, that, and then yes. yeah, that's when you get into um, the problem of evil. Now, the problem of evil, as we all know, is not an argument that demonstrates no 
God exists or that God doesn't exist. What it demonstrates is your God is an asshole. So <laughs> what she's telling you is that she believes in a God, and I assume she worships this God, right? I mean, she's, is she, like, happy about her God? <laughs> No, oh, yeah, everything but the Old Testament. Yeah. You know. Okay, so in other words, what she's, <laughs> saying, she's saying is, I love this God who believes that the free will of a rapist is more important than the free will of the child being raped. That I think that it's worth it to let a child be raped because I really, really put a high value on a rapist's free will. And Tom, another question, another idea, and I've heard this on this show many times, is ask her, you know, when she dies, does she get to go to heaven? <laughs> and if she goes to heaven, will she be happy? And she'll probably say yes. And you say, will you be able to choose and do anything you want while you're in heaven? And she'll say yes. And you say, so you're basically saying you'll have free will in heaven. Mm -hmm. So you have free will <laughs> in heaven. Right. And nobody's being raped. And no one's being hurt. So you can <laughs> right. do anything you want and no one gets hurt. Yeah. If God has that power in heaven, he must have that power on earth. So he's chose not to set that condition on right. the toggle switch, which means he's a dick. Yeah, so, and I mean, it's so interesting how though they parse the free will, right? So if they, yeah. it, like for example, I have never had ever in my life the slightest desire to rape anyone. So why couldn't God make everyone like me? Like, do I have a limited free will, right? <laughs> Am I, is my free will impeded somehow because I don't have this desire? I mean. If, if you can live without that desire and not have it in you and still be considered to be one of the free will beings running around on the planet, couldn't we all be like that and be free will beings that simply do not desire this? Or if you have free will, can you walk off the top of a 20-story building well, and survive? And it's like, it's like what the Scottish yes. caller was talking about earlier, right? Is free will, what can it be beyond just being able to exercise your desires? So if you don't have desires to hurt other people then you're exercising your desires, you're exercising your free will, you, no one's stopping you from doing what you want, right, from what you want. Now, whether or not what you want is dictated by other things, that's another story, but the fact is you want these things and you're able to go and get them and go and do them and you don't want to hurt other people and so you could set up a world where you're not, where nobody wants to hurt each other and we all run around doing exactly what we want and not intentionally hurting anyone. And of course, the question I like to ask people is, could God have made the world in such a way that you would have free will and not suffering? And if they say no, oh. th then he's not all powerful. Right. If they say yes, oh, yeah. then well, why didn't he? You're, yeah. you know, you're just, it's, it's a constant thing. So there's multiple ways to come at it. Yeah. Um, and, is you know, your God all powerful? Is your God all benevolent? Is your God... Um, what is it? It's, all knowing. It's all knowing. Yeah. So, yeah. It, do you know? Does he know about suffering? Omnific. Does he care about yeah. it? Does Omnific. he want to? Does he want to stop it? And if he doesn't, then again, it's like then you're just worshiping a god who knows about it and doesn't care. Yep. And if the if the answer is you know he's going to sort it out at the end, it's really not because if that rapist finds Jesus, he's going to heaven. So it's exactly. not. It's not sorted out. It doesn't. It, it's not a system of of balance, right? It's like a weird, weird system. Well, that... and I had once had a Christian ask me, I said, well, if you don't believe in punishment in the afterlife, what do you do with that child rapist? And I said, you imprison them, you lock them up. It gives us all the more motivation to solve the problem here right. today, because that's the only option we have. Letting it happen and letting people suffer is a Christian worldview. Fixing it is a humanist, is a secular worldview, because we are the only ones who can solve problems, and we need to do that. But once you believe it just happens because it <laughs> happens, why do you solve it? And quite frankly, if God has a plan, why do you pray? Who the fuck do you think oh. you are to change God's will? I mean, if he's got a plan, why do you think he's going to change it for you? There, there's. I live with the Baptist who... Uh, I posed that too, and he had no. He, he, he danced around it. He had yeah. no answer to it. Yeah. It, it should be really easy if God exists. He can show up. I mean, the last time he showed up was on a piece of toast. That if that's not that's all he's got. Oh, you clearly never saw the pretty, dog, but. Yeah, he's pretty weak. Well, I don't know if that's better. <laughs> uh, but but really, I mean, the only way to uh, convince humans that you exist is to help them write a book, fifteen, eighteen hundred years ago. Yeah. 
and make it full of errors and riddles. Uh, okay. Well, I want to thank you for your call, Tom. It's hey, fun thanks, Tom. Chatting with you. you get to wrap the show. Say goodbye to all the viewers, Tom. Goodbye, viewers. <laughs> yeah. I'm Good glad night. I got on. All Good night, Gracie. Okay, Treat a... these people nice. See you later. <laughs> bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Wow, we got through lots of calls. We had a really good mashup. I guess we're done. Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.